Welcome, everybody, to the second plenary session of this conference. My name is Eivind Eide. I come from the chair of Digital Humanities at the University of Passau, but I'm here now in the capacity of chair of the ADHO Awards Committee, which is a very, uh, very, very nice position to be in because we hand out things to people and they tend to be happy to receive it. The Awards Committee is responsible for a number of ad hoc awards. We will hand out 18 bursaries to young scholars during the banquet on Friday, which is a record number of bursaries awarded. Still, the number is far from sufficient. We had more than 40 applications this year, all from eligible young and emerging scholars with accepted papers or posters. To extend the number of bursaries further, we would very much like to receive not only donations, but also good ideas for raising funds from our bursaries. So please get in touch with me afterwards if you have ideas or cash. <laughs> we also hand out two Lisa Lena Opas Henninen awards in the memory of Lisa Lena Opas Henninen, a leading figure in digital humanities who was the chair of the European Association when she sadly passed away last year. These prizes are connected to different conferences from year to year. And this year, the first round of prizes will be handed out in recognition for presentations at the Methods in Dialectology conference in Groningen in August. Last year, Willard McCarthy was awarded the 2013 BUSA Award, a triennial prize in the memory of Father Robert BUSA, awarded to recognize outstanding lifetime achievements in the application of information and communication technologies to human humanities research. <laughs> a call for nominations for the next prize is out now with a deadline of October the 1st. The chair of the 2016 BUSA Awards Committee is Hugh Craig. If you have a candidate for the prize in mind, please get in touch with Hugh to present uh, uh, the, uh, the application, the proposal, sorry, and also for more details about the prize. The call for nominations is also available from the ADHO webpage. And please, please feel, feel free to ask me questions if you need further details about this. On Friday, during the closing plenary, we will hand out the 40-year prize for the best presentation from a young and emerging scholar. The shortlist for the prize was presented in the opening plenary yesterday. Please be at the closing plenary to hear digital humanities history being made. But last, but far from least, we award the Sampoli Prize. I will now introduce the introducer by handing over to Professor Corina van Dalen Oskam, chair of the 2014 Sampoli Prize Committee, who will introduce the prize as well as this year's winner. Please. Well, as you have heard, the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations hands out several prizes. And you've already heard my name is Karina van der Oskam. And I was the chair of the committee uh, that selected the candidate for this year's Antonio Zampoli Prize. It is given once every three years to recognize a single outstanding achievement in the digital humanities. It is named in honor of the late Professor Antonio Zampoli, who passed away in 2003. He was one of the founding members of the ALLC, the Association for Literary and Linguistic Computing, which is now named the European Association for Digital Humanities. And as ALLC president, he helped to establish the joint conferences with other digital humanities organizations, which are now gathered in ADHO, the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations. Our laureate of this year is Ray Siemens. He is Canada Research Chair in Humanities Computing and Distinguished Professor in the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Victoria, Canada. He is well known for his contribution to many aspects of digital humanities as editor of handbooks and for research projects on the electronic book, textual editorial intervention, online publishing, human-computer interaction and interface, for instance, in the implementing new knowledge environment projects, and much more. 
The single outstanding achievement for which the Zampoli Prize was awarded to him is the creation of the Digital Humanities Summer Institute. Through this, he has contributed to teaching, mentorship, and service in the field of digital humanities on a global scale. This year, the 14th edition brought together almost 600 digital humanists. Ray Siemens has been instrumental in creating a community that has led to improved teachers, to better digital resources, and to more interest in humanities computing, again, on a global scale. And I gladly invite him on stage for this year's Sampoli Prize. Ray Siemens. Thank you very, very much. It's a great honor, and I'd say a, a little bit frightening being in front of such a, a wonderfully large group of wonderful people uh, sharing the sorts of interests and beliefs and hopes and dreams that I think uh, have typified what's brought our groups together at the Digital Humanities Summer Institute. Um, my way of saying thanks uh, is to, uh, as custom is around these prizes, to, to offer you a talk uh, in the area of the uh, the award uh, area that the, the prize is, is acknowledging. But I offer you a talk not only, whoops, <laughs> not only with magic PowerPoint slides, I offer you a talk not only from myself, but also from the entire community that DHSI represents. And one thing I'd like to do, if uh, members of the audience don't mind, is I'd like to, not individually, but as a group, uh, embarrass everyone together implicated in the Digital Humanities Summer Institute. Uh, if you're part of that community, if you've been to DHSI, if you've taught at DHSI, if you've given a lecture at DHSI, if you've shown up for the free cookies but stayed for the courses, can I just ask that you stand up so we can share in this together as a group? Wow. And now you come up and give the talk. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations to, to all of you. So, so on behalf of what is a large group, uh, I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude. Uh, for this very generous acknowledgement of, of what we do together when we meet at DHSI and, and also what happens at, at other like institutes, the DH Institute uh, at Oxford, at Leipzig, uh, Hilt at Maryland and elsewhere, and various institutes as well that are forming, reforming and moving around. And I know there are a number of others in the room. Uh, James is here from Oxford, Elizabeth from Leipzig and others. Just want to thank you as well for being part of this incredible community, doing what we do. Uh, and, uh, and also together uh, working in the memory of such a remarkable community member, Antonio Zampoli. I'd like to begin with that. Um, I'd like to end up here ultimately talking about the Digital Humanities Summer Institute. And uh, if you'd like to take a peek at that, uh, we all in this community have our laptops open, our phones going. The URL is dhsi.org. And there are some things there that could be rewarding and of interest to those in our community. I'll end up there. And along the way, I want to touch on these topics, talking about digital self-determination in the humanities, focusing, as I move in that direction, on communities of practice, and talking about the methodological commons along the way. Begin with this foundation. No, no talk on digital humanities, I think, is devoid of, uh, of navel-gazing, of uh, the profitable, productive kind that we seem to engage in a fair bit. And, and one of, I think, the most profitable and productive enterprises associated with our considering the digital and considering the humanities as they come together is when we begin to ask ourselves, how do the humanities fit? There are some key differences between the humanities and other differences, and there are some key points of disparity when people even begin to define computation when they begin to define the humanities. And being a simple, flexible person around these sorts of issues, the, the type of definition I find most productive to work with is one where you consider the humanities, let's say it's on this side for a moment, which is a, a vibrant set of disciplines and subdisciplines that's always had a certain type of currency over time, even though we may not have called them the humanities, always changing, always reflecting, looking at the nature of the human, human experience over time from the representation of its uh, of that experience and its material manifestations, 
And let's say over here, just for the moment, they're going to come together in a second, over here, computation, uh, the digital, whatever we would like to call that, which itself has methods, approaches, technologies, which are changing all the time. When people typically talk about these two things uh, in a group outside of our own, people think, oh yes, computing is changing all the time, but they make the assumption that the humanities are staid and solid and have always been that way, and it's just not the truth. These are both very dynamic enterprises, and what's most interesting to me, I hope to members of our community, is when we see those things coming together. Two dynamic points of view, two very dynamic sets of approaches, methods, and content that are meaningful, not only to us, but to the society we serve. That point of intersection is, I think, the most valuable way, from my own perspective, of looking at, uh, at what digital humanities is and where our ideas and our work together sit. Even so, I find when we talk with other groups, we not only have to define what the humanities are from whatever perspective we may be closely associated with or most closely associated with and define what computing is so we can talk about digital humanities together, we also have to talk about how the humanities fit in a digital age. Uh, I'm not the only one in this room who's been involved in discussions uh, over, gosh, the past several years where, where members of other communities will come and say, we, we love the humanities, we respect what you're doing. Digital humanities is a growing, phenomenal enterprise. We will give you three positions, but they'll be in computer science. But we will be drawing on work done in particle physics. All wonderful things. But I wonder in that context, what happens with the humanities part of the digital humanities, the humanities part of humanities computing, or whatever words one might use to describe uh, what it is that brings us together. We have to ask ourselves, I think, how the humanities fit in a digital age in a way that reflects all of those in the humanities and all of those implicated and drawn in and partnered with and fully incorporated and embraced by the methods that we ourselves approach. This is a place where it's very productive, I think, to engage in the process of trying to define the digital humanities. Loosely, generally, ultimately, I think, in a forward-looking, open, inclusive vision, which is what has been termed the big tent, where we talk about building on enumerative and word-counting roots of a generation ago, continued and excellent and starling work today, but also looking at bridging and linking the past with the present and into the future. We talk about remediating old worlds. We talk about embracing new ones that are created with the technologies we use. And we talk about embracing enlarging scope, privileging diversity within that embrace, looking at public outreach and engagement. We talk also about founding networks. I think our community is probably among the top in founding networks. We think that way. We're inclusive. We work together. We get together. We build method centers, communities of many kinds. Whoops. Always building, always making, sometimes Countermaking or being mischievous in our making, but always to good end, I think. And always as part of this, organizing at various levels to achieve common goals. One of the many, many strengths of our community, I believe, is this. But just try defining all this. Try defining it all fully. Try defining it all accurately, comprehensively. Try defining it in a way that two or three people will agree, much less a room of five or six hundred. Try defining it in a way that's actionable. Try to finding it in a way where you can situate your own program of research or that of your group. Try talking with your department chair about this. Try facilitating or defining it enough to be able to situate a group across a faculty or across faculties and departments and so on. Try to finding it in a way that's actionable, that is, that you can do something with it. That seems to be a very important pursuit. And yet when, when one does, I think, at a local level, within an institutional structure or context in which much of this work takes place, one tends to arrive at institutional or, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> discipline-specific definitions, which do have some sort of gain in that you, uh, you can frame yourself in the terms and the framework of extant disciplinarity, but ultimately a loss in what the future could be and the collaborative opportunities and uh, and, and a vision of the wending of the intersection points between the humanities and digital could lead to. One can also take other types of approaches where you completely ignore the institutional and the disciplinary and focus instead uh, on, on a revolutionary approach and, and write, be involved in writing one of the many excellent manifestos that exist in the area. Uh, this is something that's been picked up, that revolutionary approach in the digital humanities on a lot of what, what some might call the marketing of DH. And I, I know uh, those who often question the value of the digital humanities, call it something like the marketing of DH when one begins to talk in revolutionary terms. Try defining all that in a way that's actionable. I'm not sure it 
can be done to the degree of anyone's satisfaction, perfectionists that I'm sure we all are. Uh, even so, I've had the pleasure of trying several times with some wonderful colleagues. In this example uh, up on the screen, the 2004 publication of the Companion to Digital Humanities, which I was very pleased to, to edit with Susan Schreibman and John Unsworth. And we felt at the time to be relatively unrevolutionarily working to provide a working definition of the digital humanities across many different types of approaches and focal points, working in unrevolutionary fashion, arguing from discipline, traditional disciplinary pursuits, to principles, practices, applications, pragmatics of various kinds. And we tried again in 2007, this time myself having the pleasure of working with Susan Schreibman on this, arguing within the context of literary studies from subdisciplinary traditions to issues of content and method modeling. It's a very important process to engage in. There have been some great recent examples of many kinds, formal and informal alike, worth focusing on, worth paying attention to, worth participating in. And yet, I think what we have to come to a realization along the lines of something like this, a full and accurate, a comprehensive definition of the digital humanities is relatively elusive. One of the things that makes, I think, Wikipedia such a wonderful home for the expanding, changing, influx definition of digital humanities. It's a natural receptor for this confluence of two constantly changing focal points as they meet at an intersection point. So even though we may realize uh, there will likely be a, a good, valuable, appropriate disagreement on this realization, uh, even though if you'll bear with me, we may realize that full, accurate, and comprehensive definitions are elusive, I, I do believe we need enough of an understanding to move forward. For this understanding, I think we have a number of options. We can work with what we already do and call digital humanities or humanities computing or les humanities informatiques or however we want to approach that. But we're not going to be able to move beyond what we already do if we label precisely, definitely, in a detailed way in that direction. We can take revolutionary steps, but we run the risk then of throwing the baby out in the bathwater, disconnecting ourselves from a path that's ultimately, a past that's ultimately very valuable to us, however elusive elements of it might seem, however inappropriate elements of it might seem as we move forward if we take that approach. My preference here, and one that, that I see reflected in a lot of the work that many of us do, uh, is working with what we know, building positively towards a future that involves a reflection of the past and continuing pursuits over time, looking backward, embracing the present, continuing forward, I think, to a number of possible futures, which is, I think, as appropriately vague as my own definition of the confluence of the digital and the humanistic in digital humanities. For this type of thinking, though, for this, for this uh, approach to this particular issue, I think we need to switch our mode of thinking slightly from a chief focus, typical chief focus on what it is we do when we get together as digital humanists. And I think that's terribly important, but I think we need to look a bit beyond that. I think we need to think more broadly about also where and how it is we do what we do and what others like us do. And all that comes with it, where and how, including what, and including ultimately who we are. At this point, the notion of the community of practice seems particularly useful. Uh, there are many other points, I think, that uh, the notion of the community of practice is appropriate when talking about our community. And my first encounter of that, uh, that usage in our context of our many communities that comprise the digital humanities is in connection with the Text and Coding Initiative Consortium, where Julia Flanders and Dan O'Donnell and a number of others began looking for models for what was going on. Very interesting work going on in the Text and Coding Initiative community and the definition of that work and the people that came together for that work being the community of practice. That approach allows us to not only understand what it is we do, but also who we are, where we do what we do, and why we do it in the way that we do it. Uh, again, Wikipedia, a good place to go for this. It's a fairly recent notion, at least named as such and treated as such, but also relatively fluid. Where I think it's most applicable to us, where it's most applicable is we take the lens of the community of practice and and look through it on digital humanities, is that it allows us to see that what sits at the core of, of almost any group, from local groups to international ones that are brought together in the ways that we are, is the members of its community. And what's most unique in a DH context about the members of its community is a set of practices shared amongst those who identify as digital humanists in particular. And I think if we're willing to view from this perspective, through those practices in our community that make us unique and bring us together, 
in that way, we begin a move that clarifies, excuse me, clarifies our understanding of the sorts of initiatives we might engage in together, that might bring us together, that might, and the shapes that those sorts of initiatives and endeavors might take. In doing so, we consider things like this and all that this diagram suggests, including making connections through conscious activities, ways of coming together, ways of focusing ourselves together on whatever tasks it is and objectives it is and initiatives that it may be that we set for ourselves. Perhaps we meditate in this way also. But ultimately, I think, and very happily, we end up finding ourselves together as we are. At DH 2014 in Lausanne, we find ourselves members of the International Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations. We find ourselves as members of the constituent associations and organizations that comprise ADHO, which is really the formal structure of our community of practice. It's formalized by a number of national, international, <clears throat> excuse me, and extranational organizations uh, manifest as what are called constituent organizations in ADHO. And ADHO's focus on, since conception has been on uniting our constituency as individuals in these larger organizational structures and ultimately providing the sort of infrastructure, the sort of opportunities, the sort of um, uh, opportunities that, that bring us together to allow us to do the sorts of things that we all do, even as the communities in which we work at local, regional, and national levels and extranational levels change, morph, evolve, even as the technologies change, even as our predilections about the work that we're doing changes, even as our disciplinary homes for many of us change, some quite revolutionarily, over time. So what sits at the core of any group like ADHO, to, to flip an earlier notion of community of practice around a little bit, is the members of the ADHO community. What's most unique about those who are in the constituent societies, uh, constituent organizations that make up ADHO, is the set of practices that we all share as we identify with each other as digital human humanists of, of various kinds. And if we view ADHO from this perspective, I think we can see, we can begin a move that highlights ADHO's own role in the digital humanities and in also the methods, the practices that bring us together and that we apply together on the work that we engage in. I'll come back to this point in a few minutes. The community of practice, uh, at least in my experience in the digital humanities, has never been divorced uh, from the notion of the methodological commons. If we're willing to view ADHO from this perspective as a, a point, a, a group that brings together our community of practice or communities of practice across constituent organizations based on the methods, processes, and practices we have, if we're willing to understand ourselves in this way, the notion, I think, of the methodological commons, uh, common in our community, um, that encapsulates our practices is very valuable for us to consider. Not only in the context of our work now, but our work as we imagine the future, whatever the future might be. Methodological commons has been described, discussed, and envisioned for about 15 to 20 years by my recollection in our community. Uh, the images I'll show you are just some that you could find if you Google this term. Um, most common though, most used I believe is, is this one. Um, a rough intellectual map for humanities computing, which I borrow from, from short, uh, from a report of 2002 called Mapping the Field to ALLC. Here we see the methodological commons imagined uh, visually and graphically best as a, a series of evolving convergence points, not just the digital and the humanities, but many different disciplinary groups, which one finds in one part of the diagram, coming together via, via a series of of, uh, of direct, indirect, crossing uh, arrows uh, with clouds of knowing, uh, which we find in another section of the diagram, all converging on the central things, uh, the central objects, if you will, that our community interacts with. Data of n various kinds, modeled processes, programs of various kinds, which sit together, mapping and modeling our data, our process in the center of the methodological commons. Um, the nature of this assumes uh, different types of disciplinary focus over time, of course, but we find examples, I think, well illustrated here. Um, and in typical fashion, uh, this changes over time too. Here's a more recent one from 2006, distributed on Humanist. This approach allows us to identify 
I believe, with, with some accuracy, the sorts of trends as we look back, the trends that we can encounter now and imagine being prominent in future. Largely, the methodological commons is focused on disciplinary and extradisciplinary interaction around modeled data derived from analog and other sources and modeled process, which we, we, uh, we prototype, if you will, in various types of programs that enact our analytical and other sorts of processes on that data, drawing on it. We do content modeling and process modeling, but I would also suggest in here we also do communication and dissemination modeling of various kinds. Um, <clears throat> these are the areas that we focus, and specifically in these areas, and I'm not telling any of our group anything that we don't already know, the sort of thing we tend to watch are increasing access to, to large data in widely usable formats. In terms of process, we, we, we notice an increased familiarity amongst our colleagues and those beyond the, uh, the expert communities in which we work. Uh, with analytical processing of various kinds, tools that work across disciplines, for example, work across disciplinary data sets quite readily and amalgamate and allow us to do more than we've ever done before, allow us to test ideas in ways we've never tested before. One of the wonderful things we do as a community, I think, is in and around this. Further to that, I'd also add communication, communication amongst those working in our community, communities that exist around the data, but also broadening beyond those specialist communities broadening beyond disciplinarity into interdisciplinary and much further. The sorts of trends I think we see with that foundation are very positive, a little bit scary depending on the perspective one has. Increased data is something we are gonna be facing on a scale probably we've not seen for some time, probably not reflective of past growth. Also, incorporating new methods of data generation, including socially based or crowd methods, but perhaps well beyond that. You add that increased data to increased workflow, speeding, as our tools get better, as our tools work across more data sets, as our tools are more readily accessible to those outside specialized disciplinary and subdisciplinary groups, as our tools are, as we've seen trending in the past, picked up by members uh, in society at large and put to very good use. Add to that accelerated communication of various kinds, like the kind that we enjoy so well in this community on Twitter, not only with other experts, those in this room, but also experts well beyond this room and experts in the society at large that we serve. You add that together and we've got some very interesting potential futures for our community and for others. Particularly, we're working towards what I think could be a better ability to pose new types of questions with better means of pursuing them uh, better able in our pursuit to reflect our own concerns as experts and those in the society at large that we serve. Our community will want to be prepared for this, as self-evident as I think these points could be to, to many in the room. I think our community will want to be prepared for this or similar eventualities. This changes the way scholarship has been done. It certainly accelerates it, but there are those who argue that it radically alters the way in which we work in our community and the communities that maybe are disciplinary homes beyond DH. Some very real and important differences could be realized through these changes in the future. The price, precise direction is hard to predict, of course, but if we're flexible in our understanding of what it is we do, how we do it, who we do it with, and where we do it, I think we're ready for this type of future and the positive challenges it lays for us. How does our community of practice respond to these sorts of trends? Well, one way, I think, is simply to be open about what it is we do, to speak openly about what we do, and to engage in processes that ultimately, like the defining of digital humanities, are productive but may not lead to any sure, fixed answer beyond providing something that allows us to take action as we anticipate what comes next. This is a potentially pivotal moment, I think, not only for the humanities and their connection to society at large, but for the role of the digital humanist in this equation. The humanities are ultimately becoming digital. I don't need to say that, but for the next part of my argument, it will be important. And it's digital humanists who know the way best. Training and curriculum in our community becomes a very important part of our response. In an environment, institutionally and extra-institutionally, disciplinarily and extra-disciplinarily, that can be very tricky, very difficult to predict, very difficult to, to operate within knowing what the potential and possibilities might be. 
Working with training of various kinds, though, I think gives us an appropriate answer to this. And, uh, and to talk a little bit more about the sort of answer that, that I'd like to suggest we consider even more broadly than we already do in this community, I'd like to draw on some work done in preparation for uh, DH 2010 at, at King's, uh, where we were working towards a topology uh, of training, working from the least formal, bottom up, to the most formal. Uh, among informal types uh, of training we looked at when uh, uh, I had the pleasure of working with a small group which involved also a wider survey in our community, we began to look at the least formal of the sorts of exchanges that we drew upon as we, in our community, in essence, trained ourselves, beginning with things like collegial discussions where one would have a question, know that a colleague down the hall had expertise, perhaps walk down the hall, knock on the door and say, I, I need your expertise on this. Can you show me how to do this? And that person would say, quite likely, in the spirit of the digital humanities generally, words like this. Here it is. Just do what I do. There's a whole training initiative and protocol based on that type of approach. And it's great. Scale up from there. It's hard to count those types of interactions, but they happen all the time. We see it online. We see them in brown bag sessions of various kinds where people simply get together and talk on a regular basis over lunch about the sort of work that they're engaged in. Moving there into formal consultations and up to regional, national, and international skills-based workshops. So in our topology, we began from the bottom up in that, in that way. Looking top down, we saw a very different view. We started looking at more formal curriculum of an accredited kind, beginning with dedicated PhD programs, looking at masters and undergraduate programs, DH-inflicted programs, and occasional curriculum. Um, and we imposed over that, after working with members of our community and talking about what seemed important about that, that type of topology, what value should we, we put in that attribution, we looked at things like institutional and field legitimacy. We looked at enrollment numbers. We looked at cost of delivery. We looked at formality of offering. We looked at ease of establishment and implementation. And we looked beyond that to agility with respect to developments in the field. If our field is moving quickly, agility is something that's very important to have in, in any sort of formal fixed structures we have, as well as those which are less formal. We ultimately came up with something looked like this, uh, something that looked like this, where you see the formal, more formal things represented uh, closer to the top, the more informal represented closer to the bottom, and you find the factors that we were working on in this research uh, listed just off to the right, um, varying in terms of, of higher and, and lower um, <clears throat> excuse me, lo lower possibilities. So for example, a dedicated PhD program is much more higher, uh, much higher in terms of institutional legitimacy and formality, also higher in terms of per person costs. Um, whereas collegial discussion and online networking, for example, are much higher in terms of the approximate numbers that one can train, the ease of implementation and uh, the clear agility. One of the great things about informal discussion, uh, uh, if we call it training, is that you can change your mind on the fly as the version of your program changes or whatever it is you happen to be talking about. Uh, we, we then began to, to look for patterns in here and ultimately as a group focused from the perspective of intervention, where we should spend our time, we focused on a sweet spot that we found ultimately sitting somewhere between occasional inflected curriculum and regional national skills-based workshops. This was a revelatory to us uh, four to five years ago. We hadn't expected uh, the results of our research to point in this direction. What we'd actually expected was we would see a lot more and more formal type of training, more PhD programs, more master's programs. So what we were finding was people were focusing on this sweet spot in the center in and around the workshop model. For us, we took that back to the Digital Humanities Summer Institute uh, advisory group uh, constituted in a very informal way uh, about 14 years ago. Uh, we're entering our 15th year in 2015. And we asked ourselves a number of the questions that had been part of our research focus uh, for the enterprise I just spoke about and decided that we would reinvigorate or alter, if you will, the course of DHSI and the way in which we were doing things to match that model, to focus on ease of agility and implementation, uh, focus also on the number of uh, members of our community we could work with at any one given time and also begin looking beyond what we were doing locally at University of Victoria to, to the big world represented in our community of practice by, by the constituent organizations of ADHO and ADHO itself. One of our responses to this at the Digital Humanities Summer Institute was to what we said work the sweet spot up, that is focus on, 
on where the most ready point of intervention was for us and begin to move into, into accredited curriculum and ultimately towards master and doctoral sorts of programs from a training perspective while not losing uh, the agility and, uh, and the flexibility we had with the way the workshop had been run, our workshops had been run at that time. With a focus on blending formally directed and participant driven curriculum in an accredited framework. Some of you will know about Digital Humanities Summer Institute that we offer training in rudimentary, not rudimentary, uh, basic digital scholarly pragmatics um, and, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, uh, and, and essential skills. And then we layer that up. And each year we put out a call for proposals for those who would like to teach the sort of work that they're engaged in and expert in. Um, this is how we ensure that there's participant driving uh, of, of the curriculum we offer. And every year we offer as many of those courses as we possibly can. At the same time as participating in that sort of development and growth, we began looking for ways to, to work with others, to bring them into our community, to bring them to Victoria, to bring them more broadly than Victoria into the sort of training that we were doing, into our community of practice, if you will. Uh, we've been very, very lucky in working with a number of sponsors who I'll show a slide of that wonderful group in just a moment uh, to the end of ensuring that we're operating and working in that way. At the same time, we as a group decided we were going to continue a, a slow and steady development of the accreditation model, which I'll speak up uh, about more in, in just a moment, and looking more broadly to an informal network of digital humanities institutes and other sorts of curricular offerings. One of the positive results of this was coming together in an ad hoc proximate international training network consisting of these partners and more um, where we in essence came together informally and just asked ourselves and each other, what is it we do? How can we work together? How can we share our foundational courses? How can we share the expertise that's building at the expert and intermediate levels? And how can we ensure that it's distributed temporally, geographically to members of our constituency who are most engaged in what it is we do? working within and among members of the DHSI partner network uh, and well, well beyond. Working not only with institutions and say uh, faculties and departments within institutions, but also research centers within institutions, working with also large research programs, working with large agencies beyond ADHO, but definitely including ADHO, including constituent organizations like the Canadian DH group uh, and also ACH, but also having a pleasure of working with groups like Haystack, Modern Language Association, working with the Canadian Federation, Interdisciplinary Canadian Federation of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, and with our funding agency, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and ultimately working towards, in that context, a graduate professional certificate in the digital humanities, which draws on, I think, the best of what it is we do at all the training institutes in our informal network and those, those beyond who, who are not yet working with in that way, uh, and f allows one to take five of these types of courses and receive a certificate for them in a way that we haven't been able to do before. Some of them having to be taken at Victoria, which is the institutional home for this particular offering, but we hope that this will be something we can share with others and, uh, and incorporate others in long term, especially em embracing, I think, the ad hoc proximate network of digital training institutes of the sort that we are. Next steps also have been working towards a formal ad ho network. And I have the pleasure of saying that after two years of formal and informal consultation in this vein, uh, at the meeting of the ad ho steering committee yesterday, we were given leave, permission, empowerment to, uh, to initiate a formal ad ho uh, adjacent and sanctioned network of digital humanities institutes. And this is a really positive step forward, I think, for us. Um, as we were leading to that, some of you will have seen that we sent around a questionnaire asking if we were able to do this sort of thing, what sorts of issues should we be embracing and engaging first off? Uh, the sorts of issues that members of our community suggested is we should be looking at coordinating international partnerships, uh, coordinating curriculum across these institutes and, and to, to, to others as well, discussing curricular models, sharing publicity, having a formal summit on DH training, so a subset perhaps of this group and, and the interests that bring us together now. Looking at temporal geographic coordination so that offerings in the area are available more broadly. Um, and perhaps most importantly, advice and peer support, all in a context that I think represents the diversity and many strengths of our community um, uh, at the CO level and also through SIGs like uh, GoDH. 
We hope to initiate this in the coming year. In fact, we'll be having a meeting very soon about this. So in this context, ask yourself, in a, in a world that is asking us as digital humanists, which is the way forward, what's the most appropriate response for us? What does the future, that digital future of the humanities look like? Is it something that we have told to us by others, collaborators who are helping us, or is it something that we want to be involved in determining ourselves? I hope it's something that we want to be involved in determining ourselves. And one of the things that brings us together, I think, is that attitude, uh, working positively together in that direction. But I'd urge that the most valid response is one that, that begins with those around us and us ourselves, understanding together what a healthy, open understanding of the digital humanities generally are in the context of the interdisciplinarity that it embraces and engages in many ways, ultimately suggesting the points of action like training initiatives, like large projects that push in new areas, some of which we heard about yesterday when, when Bruno Latour was addressing us, and, and have us together founding core initiatives that define who we are, what we are, what we do, and what brings us together. Absolutely key, even if we're unable to define the digital humanities, even if we're unable to define many of the moving parts, we can define them well enough so that we can discuss them as we imagine a future that's relatively uncertain. Certainly we can, we can predict elements of it. As we define a future, as we work towards a future that ultimately I believe we shape. So in my part of the world, what does that look like when the rubber hits the road, when the wheels are on the pavement? Well, I'd like to suggest that it looks like, if you take a look at the Twitter feed from the Digital Humanities Summer Institute, something like this. And uh, these are the attributions to the several pictures I'll show you in the next moment. It looks a bit like this. It looks like this, a representation of a group for our opening talk at DHSI just a few weeks ago. We'd expect that, I think. Perhaps this, all to the good, a little bit of this as well, more of that. And, well, Star Trek. Okay, so we expect a bit of that, which is good. Smiling faces in front of totem poles. <laughs> Amy Morrison's keynote, which was wonderful. About self-representation. You'll see John Unsworth, who has missed his first joint conference, sitting just in the background of the baseball cap in that picture. It looks like this, and this, and this, and this. Even this, which caused quite a stir in North America, um, posted by Hugh Chipotle, I think, uh, to the Twitter feed. A little bit of this, perhaps a little more than some would hope for. Uh, gratefully, this sort of thing. And if we're really, really, really lucky, I think what it leads to is success, where we succeed in these ways in welcoming new members to our community, sharing our community's digital practices within the models, and and, uh, and so on that I mentioned with others and at the same time bringing us closer together in those practices even as they evolve. In doing so, I think we provide the methodological foundations for humanity's digital self-determination. In doing so, I think, as they say in my part of the world, we roll our own or we grow our own or we do our own stunts or something along those lines. Most importantly, without any references to any of those semi-formal semi things, in doing so, we ensure that we hold the keys to our own future and the future of the disciplines that we represent in the humanities, determining ourselves the humanities' digital destiny from a position, most appropriately, of shared experience and knowledge. I'd like to thank you in a few ways, not only for the award, but for, for the time you've taken in listening to me talk about something that's really, really close to my heart, as, as all of you are. Um, I'd like to encourage you to come and be a part of the picture at DHSI as well. One of the wonderful things about the Zampoli Prize is it's not only a, a tremendous honorific, but it, it does come with a small honorarium as well, which I've donated back to the Digital Humanities Summer Institute to offer additional student placements, tuition, tuition fellowships for that. And working with our wonderful partner group, we've managed to match, match, and rematch that funding again to the point where we have a, a pretty substantial Zampoli tuition scholarship program for DHSI 2015. Please take a peek at what we have on offer. Consider coming and don't even apply for a scholarship. Just click through and, uh, and type Zampoli into our registration system and, uh, and enjoy all the good that I think can come from that, uh, just as there was much good that has come from Antonio Zampoli. 
Thank you for your patience, for the honor, which I'm very happy to share with the entire DHSI community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray, for this inspiring talk. And we have plenty of time for discussion. And we have to think of running around with a microphone in this larger room. So whom can I give the word? No questions? Thanks, Ray. Thanks, um, as a uh, longtime uh, member of the DHSI group, uh, I thought you might uh, be able to share a few words that might be useful to this gigantic group. Um, in what we all, or what many of us, worried about at DHSI, uh, yeah. the swelling of the group ruining the nature of the group. And I, I wonder whether you have any, any reflections that might be useful for this group. Um, in what, what seemed like a surprisingly successful expansion at DHSI, uh, when some of us were a little afraid that going from 80 to 600 might be a, <laughs> might be a stretch. Oh, well, thanks for that question. It's a good one. And as David knows, David, as you know, this is something that, that we have as a group agonized over. Um, DHSI began almost as what we now would call a that camp. What we didn't call at the time an unconference, a very informal grouping of around 35 people in the first year who came together and in coming together decided what we were going to teach and learn from, teach to each other and learn from each other. More people came the next year, more people came the year after that. And, uh, and indeed, by the time we started operating with a bit more formality, we were somewhere between 75 and 100, uh, 80, David, I think, as you suggested. Um, we had 621 participants this past year, and that's represented over about a seven or eight year period, a significant growth much like this conference and, and other conferences in the area have as well. We spent a fair bit of time thinking about exactly what that might mean, what was important about the nature of the training experience, the nature of the community experience that we really wanted people to feel, uh, especially so if, let's say, something like DHSI or another institute, but DHSI in this context was the first contact with the digital humanities. Um, we, we, we made a couple of, uh, I think, very important decisions as a group, and by no means did, did I lead the decision making here. Number one, we decided to have more social functions. So a bit of wine, some canapé, that's a great way to get to know other people and to understand the nature of the community. Um, more seriously, uh, and, and I was semi-serious about that, uh, it's something we've done. Building on that though, we wanted to ensure that the learning communities remained small and manageable, even if the the full community was much larger. So we've continued our tradition of being very concerned about smaller, say, class sizes, if you want to call it that, seminar size gatherings. Uh, uh, David, your own class, I think, at one point was 24, and we've agreed since to keep it around 15, so everyone gets to know each other. So they get to know the experts in the field and can work together seminar style. Um, those are just a few of the things that we've done to ensure that we continue to preserve what in many ways is, is the most important thing about DHSI and like institutes, which is not only learning the things you're there to learn in a very pragmatic way, but, but getting to know the community of learning, the community of practice in which we're all engaged. Um, I don't think we'll be able to get much bigger than we are now. Certainly we were overflowing in any facilities we have there, but I see there's lots of room here. So perhaps uh, <laughs> we'll have a talk a bit later on, Frederick and uh, Claire. Thank you for your question, David. Yeah, um, uh, I have a question in light of the growth that we're seeing and what you're talking about of, on the effects of uh, DH on the humanities themselves. And I'm wondering if uh, I could borrow your crystal ball for a moment. How much longer are we going to be able to call ourselves digital humanists as opposed to just humanists? Well, um, there are different schools of thought on that. Uh, one suggests that the digital uh, designation will always be important because it seems to suggest what's going on at that important ever-evolving intersection of computation and the humanities and by designated digital, it suggests that that innovation, that exploration, and perhaps even things like um, 
Well, like not being afraid to try and fail. Uh, many of us know John Unsworth's article on the importance of failure, but that tends to be a, a digitally humanistic type of notion. On the other hand, many feel that if digital humanities itself is successful as a movement, it will simply become the humanities, like many other movements of similar kinds, the argument goes, over time have simply been absorbed by the humanities. And my own background uh, is in English literary studies, and some say English departments have tried to absorb every, every subdiscipline and subdisciplinary movement around it. I don't know if that's true either. But, you know, we hear these sorts of things. Um, here's what I'm willing to commit to, Patrick, is when I, when I open my, my local paper, and I see that you've identified uh, an, an author uh, that is of international contemporary significance trying to write under another pseudonym. I think the digital humanities are not only humanistic, but uh, they're important to society at, at, at large. And I think that's a wonderful thing. I think that's a trend that will only continue in your work, but also I think in, in many others. And I realize I've hopefully successfully evaded your question. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Um, Ray, I think uh, your talk, in a sense, uh, highlights what, what I think it is one of the aspects of our community, is the fact we like to learn together. Yeah. Is differently with respect to the other humanities disciplines, which when you have to learn something, you go in your library and you try to get it yourself because you're kind of ashamed of the fact you don't know something you are supposed to. We like to go together over and over again and learn together in a sense. I think it's something that characterizes us. It's mm -hmm. just a comment, nothing else. No, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we, we, we try to tell those who are younger than us that learning can be fun, but I think it's especially fun when we do it with others who share our concerns and our values and others who ultimately we care about, not only as colleagues, but in, in, in extra professional ways and personal ways. That typifies a good, strong community, most definitely. Not being a member of the community, I will base my question on what I have heard and I think I understood between yesterday and today. I understood that there were two possible definitions of digital humanities, but unfortunately they were at the extreme opposite of one another. One would be to def define digital humanities as a basic platform of all other sciences, the new read, write, and count of any kind of modern knowledge. And the other one is just the opposite. It is to consider it the new queen of science. Formerly it was the math. Today it is uh, the brain project. No wonder Patrick Ebisher yesterday said that if the brain project has one million digital humanities, you should have as much. And tomorrow will be digital humanities. And these two definitions, if these are really possible definitions, seems to me exclusive. Hmm. That is, in a way, one could become a sect and the other one could become degraded. Uh, that's a pessimistic scenario. But what do you think of that tension between these two possible definitions of digital humanities as seen by someone who is not part of the community? Well, I appreciate the perspective. Thanks very much. I must admit, I've never thought of it exactly in the way that you've termed. Um, I, I value the perspective, and I would say just by being here, you're probably well on your way to being a member of the community. Uh, th this, this morning, <laughs> sorry, yes, welcome. Uh, this morning I had the pleasure of bumping into Bruno Latour uh, at, at breakfast, and, and one of the things I said to him is, so I guess this means you're a member of our community now, and he says, well, it must be, because that's what people are telling me. So, so welcome in that way too. But you know, uh, though I haven't thought about it in, in terms that you've used, uh, that does give, I think, a very valuable perspective. Uh, I'll tell you how I've, I've, I've always thought of it, or at least in the last few years have been crystallized. It's, it's more analogic than, than, uh, than, than, than institutional, uh, which is your definite. I think digital humanities is the interesting part of town where all the good and interesting ideas come from. The, in, the interesting ideas that shape communities are around that section of town. Some people live there, like us. Uh, others visit, but it's all good. Over there. Wow. Ray, how do you see the um 
the DHSI and also more broadly the, uh, the emergence of increasingly formalized systems of education and digital humanities intersecting with or complementing um, the kind of self-help and self-teaching ethos that's been a part of the community for so long. I think in a way I see DHSI evolving um, in this respect and, and now that you're announcing a more formal network of, of, um, of uh, you know, training and so forth and also now that DHSI itself is part of a certificate program, I see you know, an increasing emphasis on uh, you know, accreditation and so forth. And I wonder if you could say how you see that in relation to more informal and self-driven um, modes of education. Thanks, Julia. Um, this is something that, that we as a, a group have talked about a fair bit, uh, those in and around the DHSI and, and those who have helped us think through elements of the more formal accreditation that, that those who wish can work towards. And I think something to, to remember uh, maybe first and foremost, is that it's that foundation, the more informal foundation, the, the desire to teach, the desire to learn, that self-directed thing. That impulse is the most important thing in the context of all else that brings us together. Um, what we've tried to do to ensure that we're true to that impulse, true to that foundation, is to, to layer in optional ways on, on top of it. And so uh, going, you pointed back to the graduate certificate program, which provides a very formal accreditation model to something which is less formal at its root and at its foundation and soul. We've tried to ensure that that's more opt-in than, let's say, push out. It's, it's both and, not either one or the other. Um, that's the general approach. Uh, but I think by, by working with the community, by ensuring that we take our ideas from the community that's intended to be uh, manifest in terms of its practices and, and methods in what we do at DHSI and other like institutes, I think we can't go wrong knowing as well that, that all these other things will take place, all these other types of training, these types of formal and informal consultations will take place regardless. But I think capitalizing and providing a forum and, and a, a meeting point for, for the best of them. Certainly that's my hope personally. Uh, Ray, I thank you oh, very hi, much for a wonderful, uh, inspiring talk. Uh, I hope this isn't an unfair question, but I wonder if you could share with us uh, your vision for how in the future development of the things you're talking about, we can succeed in crossing linguistic, cultural, geographic uh, boundaries that, 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 that encompass a lot of what we currently do. No, thanks for that question. Not unfair at all, and, and something that very happily, uh, uh, very happily for me, I, I can report that our group has been talking about. Uh, treating very seriously those uh, those potential divides uh, and others. Um, our way of looking at that has been that something like a, a, a DH network, informal or formal, training network that would reach across those divides and ensure that across those potential boundaries uh, there is consultation, there is coordination, there is discussion about curriculum, uh, there is co-location of various kinds. We, we, can, uh, we can ensure that uh, that we're successful in that pursuit. I, I see the, the, the ability to work within the ADHO framework uh, to be key to that, not only with the various constituent organizations and emerging constituent organizations, but also those beyond who are affiliated loosely or otherwise with ADHO uh, around the world. And in particular, I think a tremendous opportunity is partnership, uh, further partnership with the Global Outlook or GoDH a special interest group, which has had tremendous impact and, and drawn fabulous attention to, to, to a number of issues that had been raised always with an ADHO in our multilingual multiculturalism group, but, but, but added uh, increased uh, life and activity that is particularly important, I think, from the perspective of community building, uh, embrace of community, and I would urge uh, training and methods as part of that. So thank you for your question. Last question around over there. Oh my. <laughs> Um, thank you so very much for that wonderful uh, talk and definitions of many definitions of DH. And I guess following on the last question, the last couple years have been incredible in growth and new ideas. And there's also been a lot of tension and there's been a lot of pain sometimes, whether we call it Growth, growing pains or Twitter wars or whatever we want to do to talk about it. And I'm just wondering from your experience, 
what you think that we as a community, both within and without, can do to embrace and move forward within those kinds of discourses, and I think you get what I'm asking about. So, well, I, yeah. I think so, and, and thank you for, for saying that. Um, my answer would be better if I were in sandals and a t-shirt, but ultimately I think what we have to do is we have to forgive in those situations um, and embrace difference and find ways of talking through difference. Um, but, but you're right, sometimes there's an escalation and manifestations that are completely unanticipated and unintended when we start using some of the technologies you mentioned, uh, reflecting the growth of our community. Um, ultimately, growth is good, but, but any growth is going to be characterized by difference of opinion, difference of types of interaction. Um, I think success for us will be defined by our ability to forgive, find ways to continue to work together uh, in, well, the profitable ways that bring us together in fora like this, but also across Twitter and Facebook and any other means. Uh, so thank you for your question. I think it's terribly important. One thing I know is that DHSI, I see a lot of people hugging. I don't know what it means, but I think it means <laughs> we're a friendly group. Uh, perhaps it means more. At any rate, those are very awkward last words. I apologize for that. <laughs> Thank you again, Ray. There are some household announcements by Claire Cliva, so don't run away yet. Don't run away now because you will be able to run tomorrow morning. Indeed, tomorrow morning we have our fun run with all information on page 25 uh, in, in the brochure. And so the meeting point is at a quarter to seven at the sports center of Uniel. You have the map inside of it. So for all the sportive DHRs, a uh, fun run tomorrow morning. Before that moment, now, now we are taking the bus for all the people enrolled at our boat cruise. It will be at a uh, past half past six, but you can already go in the booth uh, at a quarter past six. And uh, the boat is leaving about a quarter to eight in Ushi. So the bus will be, will be waiting for you outside and he leaves at half past six. I hope you enjoyed your day and I wish you to all a nice evening on the boat or elsewhere. And we see us tomorrow morning. Enjoy your day. <laughs>